So with that, since we're on the hour, to give Joel the most time uh, we can, it's my total pleasure to introduce uh, Joel Johnson, uh, who uh, from the Ohio State University, both Electrical Engineering and the Electro Science Laboratory, who's going to be talking to us about exciting new uh, radiometry uh, across a wide range of frequencies in both the, the technology uh, and applications. So thank you very much, Joel, for presenting and uh, really looking forward to, to seeing your talk. Okay, thanks, Dusty. Yeah, and thanks uh, to the IFT for the opportunity to talk today about our work in this area using microwave radi radiometry at uh, frequencies lower than we may have been thinking of using in the past, in, in this case, 500 to 1400 megahertz. Um, so this this looks like we're getting some annotations made on the screen here, so I don't know if it's possible for... for I'll, I'll, work, I'll work on getting rid of them. Yeah, thanks, Dusty. So this, this is an area that's uh, seeing growing international interest. And so there's a large group of uh, groups across the world uh, working on this topic. So it's great to see that. This is just a partial list of uh, people involved. We had a review paper published on this topic. So many of the people listed here were co-authors on that review paper, including colleagues here at Ohio State, uh, a team from the Institute of Applied Physics in Florence, Italy, colleagues at University of Michigan in Australia, at Monash University at NASA, both Goddard and JPL. And as well as other uh, collaborators. And uh, some of the funding for this work has come from NASA and in, in multiple programs from the NSF and from other international organizations, including those in Italy and uh, the Alpha Wegener Institute that uh, supported the Mosaic campaign that uh, occurred in the Arctic. So the, the motivation here is the, the success we've seen from L-band microwave radiometers over the last more than a decade. Um, including the SMOS, Aquarius, and SMAP missions, all of which deployed L-band, meaning 1400 to 1427 megahertz, microwave radiometers for observing the natural thermal emissions coming from Earth's surface. So we should point out, you know, we're talking about microwave radiometry here, which means, you know, we're observing natural signals coming from Earth. We're not transmitting anything. These are not radars. They're not so-called passive radars because they don't observe signals of opportunity. They're trying to observe the naturally emitted thermal noise in the microwave bands coming from Earth's surface. And these missions have shown that you can use this measure, these measurements of thermal emission to observe things like soil moisture in the land surface, salinity of the sea, uh, vegetation optical depth, sea ice thickness, ice sheet temperatures, the properties of internal properties of ice sheets. All those things have been demonstrated successfully from these missions, and SMAP and SMOS continue to operate and produce very useful results. Um, we should understand for when we talk about microwave radiometry at these frequencies that we're not talking about very high spatial resolutions. We're talking about coarse spatial resolutions on kilometer scales, typically 40 to 100 and maybe finer than that in some cases, but uh, typically pretty coarse spatial resolutions. But these spatial resolutions are still very useful for doing large scale Earth system studies. And these instruments have had a, a major impact on our understanding of the Earth environment. Um, and the reason we have such coarse resolutions is that our resolution on Earth is limited by the size of our antenna aperture in space. And as, uh, as we go to these low frequencies, the antenna aperture has to be large compared to the wavelength, so we're going to need large deployable antennas in space to be able to uh, operate these kind of instruments. So the success that occurred at 1.4 gigahertz motivated thinking about well, what can we do if we could use other frequencies. And uh, part of the challenge there is that the spectrum down in those low bands is very heavily occupied. So we had to deal with a lot of uh, interference from other systems, okay, from communication systems, navigation systems, other users of the spectrum. In the microwave radiometry world, we call the presence of other users radio frequency interference, RFI, to our microwave radiometer. Um, so the SMAP mission in particular had an onboard processor for helping it handle interference from other systems. I should note that this band that these instruments operate in typically, 1400 to 1427 megahertz, is a protected band where no one is supposed to transmit. There, there's still RFI that's seen. So SMAP had a processor on board the spacecraft to help with uh, reducing some of those effects. So the success of that process for SMAP also led further research to do even uh, more capable processors for getting rid of RFI. One example of that is the Qbert mission, which was funded by NASA, in which a team uh, led by Ohio State developed an onboard processor that was uh, deployed on a CubeSat from the space station that demonstrated that you could do real-time RFI processing onboard the spacecraft 
that would enable uh, trying to think about operating in heavily occupied spectral environments and doing this in a way that uh, it would be feasible from space without having to downlink too much data. And I should point out that similar systems are being developed for the EU SIMR mission and the MEDOP missions. So, and here's an example of even SMAP, um, which operates again in a protected band where you're not supposed to see interference, sees lots of interference over the world. All these little hot spots are examples of uh, emissions being received from man-made transmissions being received that aren't supposed to be there that impact our ability to sense thermal noise. But by doing some processing of that, in many cases, we can reduce the impact and still manage to do thermal noise sensing. We can't always do that. Definitely it impacts our performance. Uh, we should be carefully trying to get rid of interference in these bands, but uh, we can, you know, we still have capabilities for trying to reduce the impact of that interference when it occurs because we have to, because it's, uh, you know, the interference is there. So over the last 10 years or so, our team at OSU and other groups around the world have been investigating, given the, those successes, what could you do if you went to even lower frequencies? Let's say 500 to 14 megahertz range. Okay, why would you want to do that? because they, those frequencies offer some advantages. In particular, you know, we know electromagnetically that lower frequencies penetrate more into things and sometimes have different sensitivities to geophysical effects than, than other frequencies. Um, but the big challenge here is that there's no protected spectrum. Unlike the 1400 to 1427 megahertz range where we have protected spectrum, once we get away from there, there's not any prote protected spectrum available. So we have to, we're going to have to deal with this fact that it's a heavily occupied spectral environment. We still want to try and measure thermal noise. Can we do that? Um, if you think about that, probably there's going to be some places in the frequency range where there's just too much man-made transmissions and you can't really achieve thermal noise sensing. But other parts of the spectrum, there may not be. So if we take kind of a more opportunistic approach to how we try and sense things, rather than saying we had to be guaranteed these particular bands, if we say we'll take what's available, and do what we can with it, then that's a different way of thinking about doing microwave radiometry. And if you think about that, this is probably more likely to be successful in less populated regions like high latitudes, like global oceans, those kind of uh, places, because radio emissions tend to follow human populations. Um, another thought, another uh, thing that motivated us here was that, you know, in, in traditional microwave radiometry, we measure in these narrow bands, you know, 1400 to 1427 is a fairly narrow portion of the spectrum. And a lot of, you know, when we think about radiometry, we think about L-band, C-band, X-band, KU-band, and so on, K-band, rather. Um, and we were motivated by the idea that, well, what if we try to sense continuously across frequency, not just these narrow channels, but make a continuous measurement of the spectrum between 500, even up to 2,000 megahertz, what would that do for us? And this is kind of analogous to the hyperspectral optical uh, technology that a lot of people are working on. If we made hyperspectral microwave observations, would that help us with our ability to sense geophysical products? So I want to talk about some of the things that this uh, is motivated us to look into, what we think you can do with it, and where things currently are and what the future may be like. This is a, you know, it's an area, a growing area with many people involved. Lots of publications continue to come out. Here's a list of some recent ones. A lot of what I'm going to show here are from this review paper published in JSTARS in 2021, to which uh, many of the people working in this area contributed. So one particular science product we've been interested in, given that you know low frequencies could penetrate more, given that this technology may be more applicable to less populated regions like the cryosphere, we've been thinking about, uh, could we use this technology to try and sense the temperatures within an ice sheet? the temperature profile within an ice sheet, okay? Um, if we think about the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, they can have very large thickness up to, you know, kilometer thicknesses, three kilometers in some cases or more. Um, and, you know, when we think about modeling the future of Earth's ice sheets, there are a lot of parameters, geophysical effects that govern that. And there's a, you know, very important topic, many people working on that, trying to model what's the future of Earth's ice sheets. One parameter that we don't know very well, that we don't have good measurements of, is the temperature versus depth in an ice sheet. How does the temperature vary with depth? We can get information about that by drilling boreholes and measuring it, but it's difficult to drill boreholes over large spatial regions. So, uh, so basically, the information we have about this comes largely through models of what it should be like, and that has an impact on how the ice sheet's going to be involved in the future. So trying to get measurements, remote sensing measurements of the temperature inside of an ice sheet is a, is a topic that deserves some interest. So, um, so we thought possibly this technology could be used for that. 
because we we can penetrate you know the uh, the frequencies we use 500 megahertz can in some cases see almost all the way you know very deep into an ice sheet. Um, the thermal emissions coming from an object depend on its physical temperature. So we thought uh, this was worth investigating, and we've done some investigations of that. So the basic idea here is that uh, we have our microwave radiometer looking down at an ice sheet, and we're going to measure the brightness temperature. Okay, in microwave radiometry, we report the thermal noise power received in terms of its brightness temperature. Um, we're going to measure the brightness temperature as a function of frequency. Okay, so you can see here going from 500 to 2000 megahertz. The idea being that the lower frequencies that we use have greater ability to penetrate in things. So they'll be more sensitive to the thermal emissions coming from deeper in the ice sheet. They'll be able to, to obtain information about emissions from deep in the ice sheet. On the other hand, as we go up in frequency, we'll be seeing emissions from shallower depths in the ice sheet because the higher frequencies don't penetrate as much. The radiation coming from within the ice sheet will be attenuated uh, before it gets out of the ice sheet. So as we vary the frequency here, we'll be getting information from varying depths within the ice sheet. And therefore, we uh, that this the brightness temperature versus frequency provides us information about the temperature versus depth inside the ice sheet. That's kind of our motivation here. And this There are some analogies here between uh, the way microwave radiometry works for sensing the temperature profile in the atmosphere. Uh, there, you know, that was a long-standing application of microwave radi radiometry used in many instruments. So kind of analogous to that, but in this case with ice sheets. So if you're gonna to propose this, you know, you need to think about well, how does that actually work? You need some model of the radiative transfer of electromagnetic radiation within the ice sheet. And here's a basic sort of uh, zeroth order model of how that might work. Okay, this equation is telling us that the brightness temperature we measure as a function of frequency comes from an integration over the thickness of the ice sheet. In other words, our ice sheet is chopped into a lot of layers, and each layer can contribute some thermal emission that's going to be received by our radiometer. Uh, to figure out what that received brightness temperature is, you have to add up contributions from every layer within the ice sheet. Okay, we don't, this is not a radar system, it's not a GPR, we don't have range resolution. We just measure the total thermal noise coming from wherever it came from in the ice sheet. That thermal noise depends on the physical temperature of the ice sheet versus depth, which is the thing we want to measure. Okay, but then, uh, and, and also the loss rate within the ice at a given depth, okay, because that's what, like here, cost law, that's what leads to thermal noise emission. But then the emission from a particular layer gets attenuated as it travels from wherever the layer is up to the top of the ice sheet. So this alpha here is an attenuation constant. And uh, these, these attenuation rates depend on frequency. So as we vary the frequency, we'll be getting different brightness temperatures. And that's what leads to this idea of trying to retrieve the, the temperature profile. Now, there are some other effects as well. You know, fern density fluctuations in the upper part of the ice sheet can, can cause an impact here. The base, in some cases, may make a contribution. You know, the water is below the ice sheet. But uh, you know, the, the main term we're interested in here is this middle one, which we can rewrite as an integration of the physical temperature profile of the ice sheet over depth, where each the, the contribution from each layer is determined by this so-called weighting function here, analogous to how it's done in atmospheric radiometry. The weighting function has this form from you know, taking the watts here and writing it down here. So by looking at these weighting functions, we can get some idea of how might different frequencies respond to different depths within the ice sheet. Here's an example of doing that. So in this plot over here, we've got some example um, temperature profiles that might occur within an ice sheet. Okay, in this case, uh, a, 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 a sort of shallower ice sheet and a deeper ice sheet. Okay, one going to three kilometers depth, one going to only two kilometers. The temperature in an ice sheet, you know, in simple cases tends to be lower at the top because it's very cold up there. And as you go towards the earth, you're insulated by the ice, so you get warmer. So the temperature profile tends to increase with depth. And these are two different examples. Now, it turns out this weighting function that I was talking about depends on the temperature itself. So these two different cases have two different weighting functions. This weighting functions up here correspond to the blue case. This corresponds to the red case. What we're seeing here, again, is this weighting function, which means I take the actual temperature profile versus depth. And I'm going to multiply the temperature profile versus depth by this weighting function shown here, these curves, and then integrate that 
to find what the brightness temperature I measure is. The main point to realize here is that as we expected, in this case, lower frequencies, for example, 500 megahertz, are more sensitive to the temperature at greater depths than the ice sheet. Higher frequencies are more sensitive to the temperature at shallower depths. So again, by combining measurements of multiple frequencies, we're getting information about the temperature at different depths within the ice sheet, and therefore we have the potential to retrieve the temperature profile. Now, again, that depends on what the temperature profile is. So it's a little, some cases are, that's more clear than others, but all of these show varying contributions that with depth that depend on frequency. Okay, so again, temperature, trying to sense the temperature profile within an ice sheet is one of the motivating factors for this uh, research. Another geophysical product we're interested in is the thickness of sea ice. Okay, in the Arctic, you know, we have sea ice cover. The sea ice is changing a lot. Lots of uh, studies of sea ice. The fraction of coverage is one thing that we study a lot, how that evolves over time, the fact that it's shrinking in time. But in addition to that, the thickness of the sea ice is also of interest because, you know, that governs the total sea ice volume, not just the area covered by sea ice. And, uh, you know, the existing L-band microwave radiometers have produced some very useful products for sea ice thickness. SMOS and SMAP have, have done that in particular. Um, in addition, we can use LIDAR type instruments to measure sea ice thickness. Those have been very successful, but there's still a need for improving our ability to measure sea ice thickness, in particular in a range sort of in this medium range of sea ice thicknesses between about 50 and 50 centimeters and two meters, where a lot of sea ice is uh, that exists in the Arctic. So um, the existing L-band sensors, this is a, an example of um, showing you how the brightness temperature of sea ice, the thing our radiometer measures, might vary with sea ice thickness in some particular case. This is a, you know, there's a lot of variables here, but this is one particular case, particular temperature and salinity of the sea ice. Uh, it's shown for four different frequencies here. Okay, so again, SMAP and SMOS would be using this 1.4 gigahertz band. And we can see that, you know, the reason the radiometry can be useful for sensing sea ice is because the brightness temperature increases very rapidly with sea ice thickness. It increases rapidly up to a point that it sort of saturates and then beyond that point is not sensitive to thickness anymore. So for our L-band sensors, you know, this, this sort of uh, basic curve in this particular example would say, you know, we're not really sensitive to thickness beyond about a meter or so. We can see if we go to lower frequencies, that sensitivity can continue past that point, okay? Because again, the lower frequencies have the ability to penetrate sea ice, which can be lossy more than the higher frequencies. So the motivating factor here, again, is that use of multiple frequencies can provide us the ability to sense sea ice thickness to greater depths. Um, here's an example of a retrieval of sea ice thickness from a campaign we did in Greenland. And I'll, I'll get into a little more detail about this shortly. And then a third product is the salinity of the ocean. Okay, so both uh, SMAP, Aquarius, SMAP, SMOS, they all produce ocean salinity measurements. How much, how salty is the seawater? How salty is the seawater is a, is a uh, useful information because it tells you information about ocean currents and how the uh, transport of, uh, of energy and other oceanic processes across the globe occurs. Um, we have existing salinity maps that have been very successful in contributing to our understanding of the, of the global oceans, but it turns out our L-band sensors have, are facing some challenges with sensing salinity accurately in cold waters. It turns out the sensitivity of the brightness temperature to salinity degrades with water temperature as the water becomes colder. Here's an example showing that. This is the change. This is just one example uh, uh, curve here, showing how the straight looking down brightness temperature varies with salinity, okay, um, and for cold waters, okay, temperature, physical temperature 273K, in other words, zero degrees Celsius. Again, plotted for multiple frequencies here. We can see that, you know, to retrieve salinity, we need to have a large change in brightness temperature as the salinity varies. We can see at 1.4 gigahertz, we are getting a change in brightness temperature with salinity, but it's not huge. This is sort of a, you know, becomes challenging to measure when we get down to these smaller var variations. On the other hand, we can see for this example at 500 megahertz, we have a much bigger sensitivity to salinity. So again, the motivating factor here is that using lower frequencies could help us improve our ability to measure ocean salinity in uh, in cold waters. And this is these maps are showing the the increased errors in retrieving salinity that can occur in cold waters. 
a final product is uh, interest in soil moisture. Um, again, if we try to sense soil moisture, which SMAPs, moths have been very successful, produce some important and useful products, the, uh, our ability to penetrate into the Earth's soil uh, is governed by the frequency. And at 1.4 gigahertz, the amount we penetrate depends on various factors, but sort of on average, we talk about we're sensing the soil moisture in the upper five centimeters of the soil. Okay, so again, if we went to lower frequencies, we might have the ability to get information on soil moisture at greater depths in the soil rather than just the only, only the upper five centimeters. And here's an example of plot of penetration depth versus frequency, showing that penetration depth, which is a function of soil moisture, showing that penetration depths do increase as we go to lower frequencies. And uh, in particular, the, uh, the group at Monash University led by Jeff Walker has been leading the charge in this area and has done multiple measurements uh, from both uh, tower platforms and airborne platforms of, of, of traditional 1.4 gigahertz as well as 750 megahertz, showing that the kind of effects that can occur to improve our ability to sense soil moisture at greater depths. So those are kind of some of the motivating science factors here. So, you know, a few products we talked about there, temperature profile within an ice sheet, sea ice thickness, ocean salinity, soil moisture, all these give us a reason to look into this sort of technology. So now I want to talk about some examples of measurements that have been done to demonstrate these sorts of things. So here at Ohio State, and with our collaborators, we've uh, built an instrument under the support of NASA's Instrument in Incubator Program called UWB-RED, the Ultra Wide Band Software Defined Microwave Radiometer, that uh, measures from 500 to 2,000 megahertz. Um, again, you know, this is in unprotected bands for the most part, so interference is a major factor. We know we're going to have a lot of interference. We know we're going to have to get rid of RFI. So we do this in various ways, doing very fine sampling in time, very fine sampling in frequency. We have 6,000 frequency channels here to try and help us throw out uh, uh, interference in frequency. Um, we, we, uh, we do all, it's called software defined system because we do the RFI processing in software to help us with uh, being, you know, being able to vary things easily. The instrument, uh, measures in 12 sub, we take the 500 to 2000 megahertz, chop that up into 12 subbands and fully sample each of those 12 subbands. The instrument looks straight down. It's a nadir observing instrument to keep things simple, single polarization, and typically about a one kilometer footprint from when we fly uh, making observations. Um, and there are other details of the instrument here, but you know, key factors having to do a lot of RFI processing to make this work. Um, again, we, we take the full spectrum, we divide it into 12 channels to make things a little bit more manageable. Each of these channels then gets fully sampled, Nyquist sampled A to D and stored on, the, on and, and does some initial processing on the, on the airplane. And then we uh, save a sort of intermediate product for doing further post-processing after the campaign. We've deployed this instrument uh, in multiple campaigns in Greenland in 2016 and in 2017, in Antarctica in 2018 and as a ground-based instrument in the Mosaic sea ice campaign, observing sea ice in, from a, you know, in the Arctic. So here's some examples from those campaigns. Uh, this is the flight paths we had in our 2017 Greenland campaign. We were based at Thule Air Force Base. Um, the, the blue highlighted region we flew in 2016, we just had a shorter campaign that year and just flew this one little leg here. In 2017, we had a leg here that went further north in Greenland and went out over the uh, to observe some sea ice. And then we had another flight path that was focused on temperature uh, profile retrieval where we overflew multiple borehole sites so that we could uh, interact with, you know, make use of the borehole information, temperature profiles that were measured there. So we got a good data set to look at and try and see if we could do things like since sea ice thickness, since uh, temperature profiles and so on from this campaign. Um, again, you know, RFI is a real issue for this technology. Here's an example spectrogram, okay? So we've got brightness temperature in the color scale. We've got frequency on this axis going from 500 megahertz to 2000 megahertz, divided into the 12 sub-channels of the instrument. Okay, we have this gap here in frequency because there was a, a, a radar on board the aircraft that we you know, decided just to stay away from. And this is versus time for a region near, after takeoff, fairly near to the Air Force Base. You can see, a lot of this yellow stuff here is not geophysical. That's not what you'd expect for geophysical thermal noise. So there's a lot of interference going on. And again, the instrument was built to sort of operate in this kind of environment and to the best of its ability, try and filter out things that you could localize in time or frequency or by other means. 
So if we, this is before we do any RFI processing, after we put things through the RFI processor, you can see that we clean that up. And again, we lose spectrum in doing it. If we compare these two, you can see, especially down here in these low bands, we lost quite a bit of the spectrum in, in trying to clean things up. But uh, after doing so, we get something that looks much more reasonable from an environmental, from a geophysical point of view. We can see the brightness temperatures in this part of the flight. We actually were over the ocean for a while, turned and came over to land. So these very low brightness temperatures are over the ocean. We come up over the coastal region of the ice sheet and then continue on. We go from uh, to a region where there's a lot of uh, scattering in the ice that leads to this dip in brightness temperatures and then come back up again. And we'll uh, take a look at this some more. Again, the part of the challenge of this technology is you are going to lose a good bit of your measurements. You have to try and uh, design the instrument so that you can still do geophysical sensing, even if you are only operate, able to operate in a portion of the spectrum that's there. Um, here's after we had this, this was again, 6,000 channels to which we threw out some of the channels when we did our RFI filtering. And then to, to uh, reduce the data we look at scientifically, we then integrate across frequency in each of these 12 bands. And so here are those 12 frequency bands plotted versus time, or in this case versus, uh, sorry, versus longitude. So again, in this part of the flight, we were out over the ocean here, very low brightness temperatures across all the frequencies. Then we come up over the coastal region, brightness temperature goes up. We then crossed over this sort of percolation zone of the ice sheet where there's a lot of larger features in the fern that cause scattering, causes some scattered darkening. And then we come up over here to the dry portion of the ice sheet. And now we've got brightness temperature versus position and frequency uh, shown here. And you can see, even in these heavily occupied bands, not, you know, not as heavily as they might be in other places in Greenland, but still there's an RFI occurring, we can see that we get reasonable geophysical measurements of brightness temperatures for this part of the ice sheet. So we wanted to take those and then demonstrate that we could retrieve temperature profiles. So a little bit more on how that works. So, you know, again, we don't have a real range resolution. We have temperature profile at each frequency multiplied by a weighting function and integrated. So to make this work, you have to do sort of a model matching kind of retrieval. In other words, you, you make a model of what you think the temperature profile might be, predict what the brightness temperature is for that compared to what you measured, and then tune the parameters of your model of the temperature profile until you get a match between model and measurement. So to do that, it helps if you can have some sort of geophysical guidance on what the temperature profile might be like. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. In this case, we're in a region of the ice sheet where we could rely on a fairly zero order sort of model of the temperature profile within the ice sheet called the Robin model, in which you know it's a reasonable model for this portion for the places we flew in the Greenland ice sheet that the temperature profile could be described by this formula here. This brings the profile versus depth down to a few parameters. Those parameters are the surface, the uh, temperature at the surface, the geothermal heat flux from the base of the ice sheet, which is a parameter not well known across the ice sheet, and then the ice sheet thickness, as well as some other parameters involving physical properties of ice and the accumulation rate and so on. So we could change the retrieval problem to one where we're trying to estimate these parameters of the temperature profile model rather than trying to retrieve exact temperature, temperatures as, as a function of depth. Now this uh, is more or less applicable depending where you are on the ice sheet. We also have other efforts going on exploring other models and, and how you can do this for more complicated places than the ice sheet. So again, we use this uh, sort of model-based matching procedure. We also have to worry about the effects of the fern density and, and some other effects that can complicate this retrieval. We use the measurements at the boreholes to help us with some of those things to uh, factor out, try and factor out some of those uh, fern density profiles, which are nuisance parameters. But then after all of this, we can retrieve as a function of position what these parameters are and use them to reconstruct the temperature profile as a function of position along our flight path. So doing that, here we, and we have a paper published about this. It was in our list of papers, and I refer you to take a look at that if you're interested in more details. Here are some examples of the parameters we retrieved. This is the surface temperature showing some of the prior information that was available, as well as what the final retrieve value converged to, as well as the accumulation rate that was retrieved, as well as the geothermal heat flux, the latter being the parameter that's the, probably the most unknown uh, from the sources of data that we have. And we've also taken these temperature profile retrievals and explored what they tell us about the ice sheet 
stiffness and how it might evolve in the future. Uh, and this paper that I reference here just came out in Journal of Glaciology, led by my collaborator, Ken Jezik here at Ohio State. So here are those temperature profiles that we retrieved along the flight line. Again, this is a plot of the physical temperature of the ice as a function of depth and position along the ice sheet. The lines here mark the position of the borehole locations, Camp Century, Neem, and Ingrip. And we can see the typical uh, increase in temperature versus depth and how it uh, can vary fairly significantly over the course of the flight path. In addition, we used a Bayesian retrieval approach. So we, it, we also get the estimates of the uncertainty of these estimates, you know, estimates of the uncertainty of the retrieval. And we can see in terms of temperature that our errors do increase with depth, okay? So the error is not uniform versus depth. We do have higher errors in the retrieval, estimated errors versus depth, but these are still levels of error that would give us new information across an ice sheet that we don't really have at the current time. So, so we, you know, definitely we feel the potential of using this technology for sensing temperature profiles within an ice sheet has been demonstrated. We continue to do many studies of this, how you can do it in other portions of the ice sheet, lots of interest in uh, trying to uh, see, see how far we can take this technology. So the, again, the second uh, product I had talked about was sea ice thickness, trying to extend the thickness over which we can sense sea ice thickness. For this, as I mentioned in our 2017 Greenland campaign, we were able to travel north of Greenland and observe some sea ice regions. And so we, again, using a similar sort of model-based matching technique, we, uh, we have a model for the sea ice thermal emissions as a function of thickness as a, and frequency. So we apply the retrieval to try and sense this, to, to retrieve the sea ice thickness. And here's some plots of the sea ice thicknesses that we retrieved across our flight path, the black lines here. And uh, we were retrieving thicknesses. You know, this was a very heterogeneous ice region. So we had some places where the thickness was very low and some other places where it was up to one or two meters. And uh, unfortunately, at this particular time and place, there wasn't ground truth to compare with. So we don't really have a great validation of these results for the moment, but we were able to demonstrate uh, retrieval of sea ice thickness. It seems plausible based on you know, the general properties expected for the ice in the region. Um, we also had the opportunity to build, as I said, a ground-based version of the instrument and to deploy it in the Mosaic campaign. The Mosaic campaign uh, was an international uh, collaboration led by the Alfred Wegener Institute that uh, set up a camp on a sea ice flow and stayed there for the course of a year and, and took various lots of uh, science groups doing a lot of different in-situ measurements of the sea ice flow over the course of that year. Um, this was a great opportunity for us because we had, were able to take our measurements and at the same time have other collaborators doing lots of in situ sampling of the ice so that we understood a lot about the ice properties. Our focus in that work was really, uh, given all those in situ properties, comparing the forward models we had developed with what we measured just to kind of do a check on the ready to transfer models for these applications, which are, you know, there's not a lot of work being done in this previously. So we uh, have some a report of those results that has been published as well, showing how the, the measurements and the forward models agreed uh, well once we had the uh, in-situ information about the ice properties. So take a look at that if you're interested in more details. Again, the motivating factor here is that we think by um, including the lower frequencies, we can extend the thickness range of sea ice over which we can do retrievals. Um, we've done some simulation studies of this as well. There's a paper recently published on that. This is an example of those sorts of simulations showing um, doing a retrieval simulation. You know, if I measured these brightness temperatures, I know how they depend on thickness and salinity of ice. Could I try to retrieve thickness and salinity? If so, what errors do I expect to get? These are plots of errors versus expected retrieval errors versus ice thickness and ice salinity. In this particular plot, if I only used 1.4 gigahertz, the traditional sort of means, and if I only did this by, you know, fairly straightforward inversion of the, of the brightness temperatures that I measure, and also considering a homogeneous scene within the footprint, <clears throat> we can see here that, you know, 1.4 gigahertz definitely is useful for sensing ice thickness to uh, over fairly shallow ranges of ice, and it's not very good for trying to retrieve ice salinity. But if we add our full range of uh, frequencies, we can greatly expand, improve our error performance down to uh, for greater thicknesses of ice and over uh, and do better, you know, in general across thickness and salinity variations. And also another interesting thing about this technology is that 
it opens the possibility that we might be able, in addition to retrieving sea ice thickness, also retrieve information on ice salinity. Okay, because you know the salinity, the salinity cycle in the Arctic Oceans is a thing that's very dynamic, and there's a transition between salinity of seawater and uh, salinity in sea ice, which has also to do with uh, energy transport in the Arctic and so on. So this really is the first uh, potential that seems to have an instrument that could give us information about sea ice salinity from a remote sensing perspective. And so that's another motivating factor for this uh, studies of sea ice. Okay, I wanted to mention also our 2018 Antarctic campaign, which uh, was led by the Italian uh, Antarctic program through our collaborators, uh, Marco Brogioni, Giovanni Massaloni at the Institute of Applied Physics in uh, Florence. Uh, we were able to collaborate in this program in 2018 and also through the support of the Cryospheric Science Program to deploy uwb rad in Antarctica based out of Mario Zucchelli Station, where we conducted flights around coastal regions to look at sea ice and near uh, coastal sorts of things, as well as a flight to the uh, Concordia Station over more of the inland ice sheet. We were deployed on a twin hour aircraft there and had the opportunity to look at a lot of different targets. Uh, it's a big data set. We published the sort of more inland results in a paper in GRSL in 2021. And there's a paper currently available in the cryosphere where we did more looking at the coastal regions. It's not fully uh, accepted by the cryosphere, but it's uh, you know in the process of being accepted. Uh, here's an example of that from that campaign. Just one example that uh, we found, uh, there were a lot of interesting signatures that occurred in this coastal region of the flights in particular. Here's one example flight line. And the color scale here is the brightness temperature in our lowest frequency channel. And in this case, we're going uh, near Mario Zucchelli Station from a region of sort of more so-called fast ice, more stable ice near, you know, near the land surface to, um, to ice that's sort of heterogeneous ice, more of traditional sea ice, back to the fast ice region over an ice tongue coming from a glacier, point four here, the Campbell Glacier ice tongue, and back over to fast ice again. And in this slide in particular, we're looking at, um, here you can see the uh, brightness temperatures as a function of position along this flight line, okay, in multiple frequency channels. So we see, uh, you know, and again, we get spectral information as we're doing this. So we transition from sort of higher brightness temperatures over the ice regions to a very big dip in brightness temperatures over the Campbell Glacier ice tongue to, uh, sort of a wider frequency range over some, over the more heterogeneous sea ice type region. And in the second plot, we plotted the spectra from those that resulted. Okay, so again, we're getting spectral information by making these measurements. You can see the spectrum versus frequency is varying from cases that increase, maybe uh, nearly constant or increase slightly with frequency to those that, uh, that decrease with frequency. Okay, so again, the the trends in frequency are telling us information about the geophysical medium that we're looking at. And we saw a lot of inf interesting signatures. You can learn more about that if you take a look at that paper in the cryosphere. Okay, so, so again, you know, we talked about motivations here, why we might want to do this. We've talked about some examples demonstrating that it can potentially be done. So what if we want to do this in space? What do we need to deal with there? There are definitely some challenges and some opportunities to address those challenges. Definitely, we're going to need a big antenna, right? Lower frequency means larger antenna size, so that's a challenge. On the other hand, the opportunity is that large antenna, deployable antennas, is motivated for a lot of applications in the commercial world. And so there's been lots of developments over recent years and making large deployable antennas more affordable, more reliable, easier to deploy. So um, this is a challenge that is there, but is addressable. And uh, our colleagues in, uh, in Florence have proposed a space mission using a 10 meter class large deployable vector antenna for this technology. Um, of course, RFI is a major challenge for this technology because this part of the spectrum is heavily used. But as we've said, the systems for detecting and filtering RFI are improving. You know, you still lose, you still have to think of this as opportunistic sensing. It's not guaranteed sensing. But uh, with those systems improving, we think we can do reasonably well. And part of this is because this spectrum is not, you know, there's a lot of different applications here, some of which is navigation. Well, radar doesn't use 100% of its time, allocated time for measurements. Uh, so there are, there are, and broadcast applications are spatially, you know, de-interfered. So you'll not be using the entire spectrum all the time. And also, you know, if we use our wide bandwidths, we use long integration times, we can still try to get back some performance, even though we lose portions of the spectrum. 
And we have a paper published about what statistics was the spectrum available, what percent of the time were different parts of the spectrum available in our measurements that's been published as well. You know, uh, if we're gonna make these wide band measurements, we have to have wide band receivers that can be calibrated precisely. Radiometry is all about precise calibration. So, um, you know, that takes some definitely, uh, so thinking through the receiver architecture and so on to make it uh, stable and calibratable are definitely a challenge, but, you know, we know components tend to improve. There are a lot of different ideas about how to do this out there. So uh, this seems like an addressable uh, challenge. Also, you know, if, when we go from airplanes to space, we're gonna have the ionosphere in between us and the ground. And we also have to worry about reflected celestial sources, you know, as, as, as I worried about in, uh, in the existing L-band radio emission, radio, uh, radiometer emissions. Um, these celestial emissions can be larger the lower in frequency you go. Also ionospheric effects are larger the lower in frequency you go. So we're going to have to consider these effects, but we do have maps of these of celestial emissions and information about those. We have, uh, you know, the, the ability to correct for ionospheric variations has been demonstrated through the L-band missions. Also, if we were to observe in nadir and use circular polarization, that would reduce some of the ionospheric effects. So if, if that's, that's a, 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 an opportunity to think about. So, so again, we think it is feasible for doing in space. To get there, you know, we need to continue our studies of uh, spectrum availability just to guide what we think we're going to be able to access. We need to continue working on system issues like wideband antennas, receiver architectures, keep improving our RFI detection and filtering methods, keep refining our ability to model what we think the geophysical signatures are going to be, including understanding Earth primitivities and so on over this frequency range, and uh, continue to do airborne and ground-based demonstrations to show uh, to demonstrate success and motivate you know, getting this into space and show the science impacts of what you can do with these products. So that uh, wraps up my talk. You know, again, I hope I've shown you the motivation for this area, why we might want to do this, some of the things you might be able to do with it, um, some of the results that have been achieved so far across, you know, for many different groups across the world, and uh, the, try to motivate continuing development of this technology with the goal towards getting it in space to improve, uh, make, make it useful for improving our knowledge of Earth's environment. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joel. This is perfect in terms of uh, future technologies. Uh, so we have some questions in the chat, so you can enter your questions in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand and I will unmute you. Uh, one of the questions in the chat is, any potential applications for fully polarimetric observations at low frequencies? Um, yeah, in terms of full polarimetry, I mean, we've seen the uh, the place to start thinking about that would be the use of full polarimetry in the SMAP, SMOS, Aquarius missions. Um, I think we we would say for those missions that the the full polarimetry has been useful as an RFI, helping with mitigating RFI. It's been useful for um, um, for doing you know there's an option to use it for a Faraday rotation sort of correction. Um, I would say the geophysical signatures there have received less attention to date, but there are some geophysical signatures that are seen that may be opportunities to improve, to do some additional sensing. So I would say there's the potential there, but um, uh, our, our focus so far was just on single polarization methods to keep things straightforward because you know, our, our focus is on demonstrating the utility of the wideband observations as a first step here. But yes, I would think uh, there could be opportunities for multiple polarization and polar mimicry to be useful here. Great, I'm gonna unmute uh, Siddharth who has their hand raised. Um... Hey, hey Joel, uh, nice talk. Uh, I had two questions. Um, question one was, and I think you've heard this many times, uh, there are like way too many solutions between temperature profile and <laughs> loss um so you can like play with either knobs and still get the same brightness temperature uh, i think you briefly mentioned that you i think limited by some borehole measurements but how would you expect to do it if we you know expanded it where you, we don't have the uh, luxury of borehole measurements for density or loss that's question number one and question number two was related to slide 24 uh there's an interesting signature there. I was just curious on what it was. Um, yeah. Oh, no, slide 23. Slide 23. 
Uh, right around between minus 52 and minus 53, it looks like there's a step function um, between. You're talking uh, about this feature here, right? Uh, no, in the oh, blue, this. in the in the upper depth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, that that looks like a step function, as in ice before it is. Uh, I guess you would call it warmer, and then becomes colder. I was just wondering whether there's anything physical uh, with respect. Oh, you, to that. you mean this sort of this larger yeah. footprint here? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everything from minus fifty three onwards looks uh, minus fifty three to minus forty four looks colder, and minus fifty three to minus sixty looks warmer oh. in the upper depth. Yes, that's an interesting <laughs> point. Yes, I would. Um, um, I can't say I have an immediate answer for you on that question. I would refer you to um, this paper in the Journal of Glaciology, which I considered putting some plot. I didn't put a plot in here, but we've taken the um, the geothermal heat flux. From this retrieval as well, and compared it with some other sources as a function of position, and um, I don't think we saw some big discontinuity between around this region there. So, so, um, but yeah, that's an interesting point. I can we can take a look at that. Yeah, and then uh, your uh, your first question was about uh, dealing with the fern sorts of effects. Yes. So, so as I mentioned in the retrievals, let me go back to. Uh, to this modeling description here. So uh, the temperature profile shows up through this term, which um, in the ready to transfer equation, this is your emission from each layer of the ice sheet. But then to for the emission to get out of the ice sheet, it has to make its way through the fern on top of the ice sheet. And basically the distinction between the fern part and the rest of the ice sheet part is that the the uh, the ice density in the fern is more variable because as we know snow accumulates on an ice sheet it starts off as snow as you go deeper in the ice sheet the density increases until you get to pretty much solid ice so it's this fern region maybe in the upper 50 to 100 meters that represents this effect called the transmission through the fern cap layer so that does introduce a modulation onto which could be a frequency dependent modulation onto the uh, the emissions coming from deeper in the ice sheet so in our uh, in the temperature profile retrievals that I showed, we did use information from the borehole measurements to try and infer some information about these fern density properties, which over larger scales would is a challenge. So um, there are multiple approaches that we've been looking at to address that question. One of which is that we have various sources about upper fern sorts of processes that could help guide this sort of retrieval information. So other, basically other remote sensing information could potentially help with improving this. And that includes measurements from instruments like SAR, you know, or, or GPR type measurements, as well as uh, LIDAR type measurements, for example. And, and in addition to that, there, and there's sort of a synergy here between our interest in this area and the interests of the, uh, the uh, LIDAR measurements of, of ice sheet height, for example, in the ISAT-2 mission. And that's because the, the LIDAR measurements of ice sheet height also have similar questions about how the fern is compacting and compressing and so on. So we have some synergy, synergistic interest there. We've been, uh, there's a project going on in the cryospheric science program looking at the existing models for fern density profiles and how these sorts of remote sensing measurements across various uh, sensor types could could help with understanding the uh, the properties of the fern density. So I would say it is a challenge. There's uh, ongoing research in that area, and I think we will be able to find some solutions to address that. I think in terms of future future airborne measurements, we have interest in co-flying with other sensor types that would help address this. For example, a uh, uh, a wideband GPR. Great. So we have a, a number of written questions as well. I'll try and take them more or less in order and go between written and uh, live questions. So uh, the next written question is, can you compare the study with snow in mountainous regions? Um, we have, we do, you know, there is interest in this sort of technology for snow. So, you know, as we know, radiometry is used at higher frequencies for sensing snow. Uh, it has the challenge of very coarse footprints in mountainous region, that's a big challenge. So generally, you know, uh, this technology is not something that would likely be useful for sensing snow in mountainous regions because of the spatial resolution being so coarse. 
On the other hand, it could there could be some potential applications for more homogeneous regions sensing snow. We do have a project trying to investigate some of those questions, but uh, you know, other technologies would be better suited to sensing snow in mountainous regions. Great. I'm going to ask Mark to unmute now and ask his question. Hi, Joel. Um, this is Mark Drinkwater uh, from the European Space Agency. I'm privileged, of course, to have worked with Ken on some of the early uh, theoretical work that uh, led to the IAP instrument. And it's great to see the success of uh, the Airborne campaigns, in particular, with respect to some of the retrievals that you're doing. So I had a, I had a question that pertains mostly to, to where to go from here, because Simmer um, on the European side is an L-band radiometer and we're pushing towards um, longer wavelength, lower frequencies. And of course, we also will have complementary L-band and P-band SAR with uh, NISAR and the uh, Roselle instrument on the European side, as well as uh, the biomass P-band SAR. And so all of these complementary longer wavelength systems will, will allow us to, to, to derive information at depth within the ice sheet in the future. But obviously, the, the, we're tantalizingly close now with the demonstrations that you made um, uh, of the value of a, a, an ultra wideband instrument um, in space. And so, what, what's the next step? I'm, I'm fully aware, of course, um, of the Earth Explorer 10 proposal that was lodged on the, on the ESA side. And of course, I largely stepped out of the work, as you know, so that I don't end up in a conflict of interest for ESA. And so, what's What's your next step for uh, proposing a space-based implementation? And uh, do you have something cooking there? Thanks. Um, I Yes, there are, you know, definitely we feel that um, for some classes of mission proposals, this technology appears to have met the required TRL levels, SRL levels, and so on to, to pursue those sorts of opportunities. And so there have been multiple mission proposals and we expect more multiple mission, you know, additional proposals to occur. And this would be sort of, you know, again, this is a new technology. So it'd be sort of in the demonstration class of mission. And, you know, even with definitely, it's great to see all the mini uh, microwave things going on, lower frequency microwave things going on, but there are particular geophysical products that you can't do with, with the radar sort of uh, version of in, this, in these frequency bands or the reflectometry version in these frequency bands. So. So there are still motivations for doing this uh, that, you know, there are geophysical products you couldn't get otherwise. So, so we think it's still well motivated to pursue uh, mission opportunities here. Excellent. We look forward to seeing proposals then on, 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 on that side. Thanks. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Great. Uh, the next question uh, is, uh, could you elaborate, two, two part question. Could you elaborate on the physics linking brightness temperature with salinity and then two, are surface roughness specifically referring to the flight lines from your Antarctic campaign, as well as subsurface inhomogeneities like channels of water, confounding factors in your retrieval of the physical temperature and brightness temperature? Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> I guess the first first one was about solidity. You know, why is microwave radiometry useful for sensing solidity? That has to do with the permittivity of seawater, how it varies with salinity and temperature. Um, it's you know, which um, to zero to order that's sort of a you know, microwave radiometry to zeroth order is a measurement of the Fresnel reflection coefficient. Okay, and so if you have a variation in permittivity with salinity, you can predict how that affects the Fresnel reflection coefficient. One minus the Fresnel reflection coefficient squared times temperature is the brightness temperature, and it's that dependence that governs that. The permittivity of seawater, you know, its dependence on salinity also varies with temperature, and that's why you have different sensitivities depending on uh, whether you're in warm or cold waters, and also the brightness temperature depends on physical temperature. So. Uh, and then the other question was about the impact of surface roughness and or inhomogeneities within the ice sheet. Yes, those are those are factors. We do see in particular that um, when we're when we're in the coastal, you know, closer to the coastal region of ice sheets or places where melt occurs more frequently, then you do see a lot of inhomogeneity. You can have larger scatterers form within the ice itself, within the fern layer. Okay, you, you know. Um, we're the models we're using are assuming that scattering can be neglected in the ready to transfer equation. And that makes sense most of the time at these frequencies because the wavelengths are very long. Okay, we're talking about 20 to, uh, you know, nearly 100 centimeters wavelength. So to cause significant scattering, an inhomogeneity within the ice sheet would have to be significant compared to those sizes, which most of the time it isn't. Compressed snow grains aren't, so we don't have to worry about scattering. But if you have a lot of melt and refreeze going on, then those 
small particles can grow into larger inhomogeneities, and those do cause scatter darkening. That's what we saw in the, in the plots along the coast of, in the percolation region of the Greenland ice sheet. So we are sensitive to some inhomogeneities, but again, we should keep in mind the sort of these. The reason for using lower frequencies is to reduce sensitivity to those kind of effects. Now we know in these frequency bands, a GPR would see a layer within the ice and so on, right? But we need to keep in mind that the GPR is looking for things that are lots of dBs down. You know, that, that return from this layer inside the ice sheet may be 30, 40 dBs down. In, bright, in the microwave radiometry world, we're working in a linear scale. So that feature would be a less significant contributor to the overall brightness temperature that we observe. But we, you know, th those effects are there and we continue to uh, see, you know, we're, we're talking about effects over fairly coarse, large spatial scales and vertical scales that are probably still on the order of 100 meters or so. So still fairly coarse scales that we're looking at. So you'd be averaging over those sorts of dimensions. Great, I'm gonna ask Steen to unmute and ask the question. Yeah, hi, Jules. Thank you for a nice presentation. Very interesting and looking forward to see its progress uh, in the future. I have two questions. One of them being a bit technical. You stated on one of your slides, 6,144 channels and 12 frequency bands. Is that correct that you divide the, uh, each frequency band into uh, 512 spectral subbands? And uh, then the, the more scientific question. Uh, would that enable you, if, if you have a clean uh, an RFI free, uh, to, to, to actually have a higher spatial resolution? Uh, because uh, you, you seem to have a long integration time. Um, and then I have a third question regarding, are you not scared of sort of the really big transmitters that exist somewhere around? I recall when SMOS was launched, there was a huge amount of RFI that had not been observed from airplanes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dean. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. It's uh, 512 channels times 12. So each each of our 12 bands is divided into 512 subbands. And yes, yeah, certainly the more uh, the, the channel we can keep, the, the better performance we have and or we can trade off for integration time. That's right. Now for us, um, you know, our integration time is related to the footprint. We're not, we haven't tried to do any, uh, you know, uh, resolution refinement type processing here. So we were, you know, basically we set our integration time by the Nyquist sampling of the footprint. Um, and then, uh, sorry, your, your last part of the question was again. The last part was simply, are you not scared of the big transmitters? Oh, right. I yes. mean, and even at SMOS, we have seen some very big transmitters that sort of been filtered out, but they must exist almost nearby. So, so you get completely wiped out by the very big signals into your receivers. Yes, I guess I, I didn't mention that uh, the flight campaign I showed here, you know, 2016 was this blue line and 2017 are the red lines. The reason 2016 stopped here is because our receiver got fried by a, what seems like it was a, you know, a radar pulse. So certainly thinking about those kind of things is important. We, you know, the receiver has a limiter in front of the things. You take some hit on noise figure, um by putting that limiter there but uh after doing so we were able to complete the campaign successfully and uh you know again there's some trade between front end loss and uh time spectrum occupancy to trade off between the nedts and receiver protection and so on thank you All right. <clears throat> with two minutes left i'm going to read you every unread question and then you can you know pick whichever you want so one question is how many bands can be simultaneously taken by SAR imagery? Another says, you mentioned that SMAP frequency is protected and no one is supposed to use, though RFI is still there. I was wondering who controls which frequency is protected and which not. Uh, another says, can you comment on what RF services are expected in high latitudes within the frequencies considered? And finally, a question is, does our knowledge of the imaginary part of impure ice primitivity from L-band through megahertz remain the biggest uncertainty in retrieving temperatures at depth in ice sheets? Okay, yeah, those are all good questions. Um, uh, you know, probably the most, the highest part I want to talk about is the question about frequency regulation. You know, definitely frequency regulation is an international process. The ITU handles that. Um, the GRSS Society, in addition to having the Instrumentation of Future Technologies, Committee also has the Frequency Allocation and Remote Sensing Technical Committee. And uh, this is a very important topic for all of us to maintain the scientific access to the spectrum so we can keep making these sorts of measurements. 
So I encourage uh, people to get involved with FARS and you, you, you can learn more about how frequency regulation is managed. Both SMOS and SMAP are reporting these offenders to the national agencies that then go out and try to get them turned off. There's been a lot of success stories of getting things turned off that have been reported by these SMAP and SMOS missions. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you want to stop there, Dusty, or... I think so. I think we'll, we'll recognize people's time uh, and keep this slot going every month for as long as we can. Uh, but thank you so much for presenting, Joel. This was this is wonderful. And if you have follow-up questions, please email Joel directly. And hopefully I'll see all of you next month. Thanks a lot.